O que os campeões têm em comum? Eu não consigo pensar em nada além de obsessão pelo aperfeiçoamento. No vídeo Preço da Grandeza eu mostrei como Kobe Bryant deixou de ser um jogador ruim. Em obsessão, nesse vídeo agora, eu vou mostrar como ele se tornou um dos maiores da história. Nele tem vários depoimentos de outros jogadores e treinadores que falavam sobre a forma como Kobe treinava, sobre a sua obsessão de melhorar todos os aspectos do seu jogo. E se esse vídeo não te inspirar a se tornar melhor naquilo que você faz, eu não sei o que mais vai te ajudar. E antes de começar o vídeo, eu vou deixar aqui embaixo o link fixado se você quiser comprar a primeira camiseta Bayern Road Brasil. E sem enrolação agora, bora pro vídeo. It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally, to be able to put myself in a place where I switch my mind to something else. I switch my mode into something else. For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt. It's go time. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. Then when you leave there, it's something completely different. But when I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me. Don't talk to me. When you reflect on Kobe and his memory, what, what stands out? Man, his realness. His realness, man. He was, he was misunderstood, man. People, I asked him one time, man, like, I asked him, I said, man, why are you such an asshole? I asked him that. And he said, you really want to know? And he said to me, he said, Phil, man, some of my teammates don't understand the work. He said, so I see dudes walk into practice 10 minutes before practice and they leave right after. Why the fuck am I going to pass them the basketball? I don't respect their work ethic. I'm in here busting my ass every day trying to perfect my craft. And these dudes, these dudes don't want to work on their game. I don't trust them. But like I said, getting a chance to play with him and seeing his day in, day out preparation, um, how hard he worked on his game, getting up in the morning and, and hitting the track and the weights. And I mean, like, it's still dark outside type shit. Like, he was just, I say like an evil genius. You know what I mean? Like a beautiful mind. Like, he was so obsessed with being the best. So I get to the gym and Johnny Dawkins look, looks like he lost his dog. Like, I've never seen this guy look so just disheveled. I'm like, JD, was JD, what's going on, man? <laughs> And he's like, man, fucking Kobe. This guy, this guy, this guy had me up at 6 a.m. this morning. He was in the gym for three hours, and he said he was doing the same move for three hours. The guy was just maniacal about his work. It's 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 incredible. And this is when I knew Kobe was a monster, though. You hear about it, you hear about it, but you really if you don't see it, you really, really don't know. And so we get into a city, uh, one of the cities very late and immediately we all go to the gym and so after we get done getting our work in me and my guys we say hey like let's meet for breakfast in the morning we probably get like three hours of sleep we wake up we go down to where the food is as we walk it down you know slubbing with, with sleep in our eyes kobe bryant is sitting there with ice on his knees already right so we walk up to Kobe, we like Kobe, what what's up and he was like oh uh, yeah man i just finished uh finished the workout and um, i'm about to go do another one And at that moment, I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> We just worked out about three hours ago. You know what I mean? And like, you've done another workout and you're about to go do another one. That's when I was like, okay, I got to get my stuff together. I got to get my shit together. Because this dude right here is on a whole different level uh, uh, than even I'm on. And I'm supposed to be great. We, he took me out to eat. And I said, what you getting ready to do? <laughs> I'm going to the club. And he said, I'm going to the gym. That was him. That's what made, I mean, that greatness. That's that's where that greatness came from. His grind was sick, sick. And he wanted to be the next Michael Jordan, if not better. And uh... what made him so tough? Just his relentlessness, uh, his mentality to just seek and destroy. Anytime his jaws get tight right there, you know he's trying to shoot at least 25 attempts. The, the most competitive player I ever played against, like by far. It's Kobe Bryant, man, one of the best that I ever played against. One thing I will say is that I've seen him come from that young boy to take over the league. I mean, I think on some level, we all feel like we haven't given our all or our best in everything we've ever done. Uh, whether sometimes it's at home, whether it's at work, uh, with our job, with our 
hobbies, whatever it is. And there was something about Kobe that I think reassured us that it's possible to give every ounce of yourself and, and literally exhaust yourself to be great at what you want to do, to be great at what you love to do. Uh, he often spoke of the sacrifices it required to do that. I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. I would watch Magic play, I'd watch Michael play, and I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. You know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything, everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. So at 13 years old, I had a, uh, I had a kill list. They used to do these rankings, it was Street and Smith basketball rankings. And I was nowhere to be found, because I was like 6'4", scrawny, like 160 pounds soaking wet. So I was like 57 on the list. And so I would look at 56, 55, all the way up to number one, who these players are, what club teams they played for. So when we go on an AAU travel circuit, I, I gotta hunt them down. Right? And so that became my mission in high school, is to check off every other person, all those 56 other names, hunt them down and knock them down. So like in, at 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game, because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13, it was to be better than you when you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when you played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well-rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. <laughs> now you got a problem. I, Kobe Bryant, have decided to take my talent to, uh... <laughs> no, I have decided to skip college and take my talent to the NBA. You know, in the NBA, <clears throat> it was actually easier. Because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability. So therefore, the passion and the work ethic and the, obsession, the obsessiveness was gone. So I'm looking at that, I'm like, oh my God, it's going to be like taking candy from a baby. And I wonder Mike wins all these fucking championships. And then you had the players that had that passion, but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice. Right. You have other things, you have family, you have all these other things that you have to do. The game can't really be your number one priority. And so I was just looking at that like, man, I'm, this is going to be fun. In the muse, you said, I knew you couldn't do what I was doing because I was obsessed. I'm paraphrasing. And then you said, whether it's friends, relationship, it didn't matter. It was all basketball. Yeah. If, if I'm buddies with you from high school, if I'm a cousin of yours, what happened to our relationship? How, how did that gravitate when you went into the league and you're, you're determined to become the greatest, or you're determined to become one of the greatest? What happens to our relationship? Oh, it suffers. And, and the people that love you, like friends and family, like they know that about you. Got it. So they let you be you. And when you reconvene, you know, you pick back up where you left off, mm -hmm. but make no mistake about it, everything in between is lost, right? So those long-term relationships, the commitment of time of, uh, you know, uh, 
taking vac like I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends and or oh, just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out like I, I, I'm not I never did that but why, it was a why choice. not why, why, why didn't you do that what? well because when I retire I didn't want to have to say I wish I would have done more I don't want that Who were some of the guys that you saw and you watched that weren't just driven by the money? Were there some names that you looked at and says, these three guys are as crazy as I am? I do. I, I, at the time, I deal with what I've referred to as Goat Mountain. I went to Goat Mountain and I talked to Magic, Michael, Bird, Kim Olajuwon, Jerry West, Oscar Robinson, Bill Russell. You know, so I would talk to them. What did you do? What were your experiences? Michael in particular, he's become my big brother. He's been my big brother since I first came in the league. And what was that process like? And so I went to them and started understanding the ins and outs of the game and you know how they approach things and their level of detail and obsessiveness. And, um, and that's what I did. From the moment you got into the league, the guy at the time is the greatest of all time. Everybody wants to be like my Gatorade, all this stuff. The level of respect he had for you when he spoke about you was different than everybody else. And you're an 18, 19 year old kid at that time. Yeah. How did that feel when you heard how he spoke about you? It, it made me feel good, but <laughs> not like what I told him, I was like, you didn't say anything I didn't already know. So, you know, so like, when, <laughs> I tell you, like when we, when I was in high school, um, and uh, I used to work out with the 76ers. I used to ask him, you know, what's it like to guard Mike? You know, Mike? You mean Black Jesus? I'm like, what the fuck? Black who? Oh, well, we call him Black Jesus. Or you can call him Black Cat. I'm like, I'm gonna call him fucking Mike. That's his fucking name. So the level of fear that he inspired in others was insane. Wow. And I would tell him, I said, when I face him, we're going to go at it. He says, oh, you don't want to do that. I'm like, what? Man, you don't know me, man. And so when we matched up, I think he understood that. And, you know, when I was 18, my first year, he got the best of me a bunch of times. I was right there the next play. You're not intimidating me. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And I think he saw that level of respect because I think he was the same way at 18 years old. And that common bond is what I think uh, you know, where our connection was built. You know, there was a player, Barbosa. I don't know if you remember Barbosa. Yeah. Of course you remember. Of course. He was extremely talented for a quick first step, but they said he wouldn't do well when the spotlight was on him. Yeah. How did you get mentally and emotionally so strong where it doesn't bother you? Well, you know, it's, you got to look at the reality of the situation. You know, like for me, it's not, you know, you, you kind of got to get over yourself. Like, it's not about you, man. Like, oh, okay, you feel embarrassed. You're not that important. <laughs> get over yourself yeah, that's where you go get over yourself right like you're worried about how people may perceive you and like you're walking around and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls get over yourself right and then after that it's okay well why did those air balls happen got it high school year before we played 35 games max right week in between spaced out plenty of time to rest in the NBA it's back to back to back to back to back to back to back I didn't have the legs so you look at the shot, every shot was online, every shot was online, but every shot was short. Right? I got to get stronger. God. I got to train differently. The weight training program that I'm doing, I got to tailor it for an 82 game season mm -hmm. so that when the playoffs come around, my legs are stronger and that ball gets there. So I look at it with rationale and say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I got well, next year they'll be there. That was it. A lot of people in general are afraid of failure. How did you become one of those people who doesn't seem to be afraid of failing? Failures, it, it doesn't exist. It's not existent. What the hell does that mean? Seriously, what does failure mean? It, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination. What does Why it mean? People in the Jedi mind trick no, on me right serious. now. I was like, like, no, does it like, exist? No, I'm serious. No, I, I'm trying to think, like, how can I explain it? So, uh, let's, let's use happy endings, 
right? And then we can relate this to failure, why it's not existing. Like, you know, everybody talks about like everybody wants a happy ending, right? Now let's go to the reality of it, right? Let's look at a fairy tale story. Let's look at Snow White. Mm -hmm. She gets a happy ending. She finds Prince. Whatever she goes on, she lives happily ever after. Well, I call bullshit on that because two months later, the fact is they had an argument and he's sleeping on the couch, <laughs> right? So the point is, the point is, the story continues. The story continues. So if you fail on Monday, the only way it's a failure on Monday is if you decide to not progress from that, right? So that, so to me, that's why failure is not existent. Because you know, if I fail today, I, okay, I'm gonna learn something from that failure, and I'm gonna try again on Tuesday. What was really your work ethic like, and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean. I mean, every day, I mean, since, you know, 20 years, I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Now, my vertical was a 40, wasn't a 46 or 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive, right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them. So your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm. and it just never changed. What was the conversation like with your wife to say, listen, this is the schedule? Because look, you know, some entrepreneurs, they're coming home at night and late, oh my gosh, my wife is upset because I came home at 11.30. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, what a <laughs> sacrifice I'm making. You know, yeah, this life's, yeah. you know, I don't know if I can do this. Sure. You're on the road nine months out of the year, if you sure. especially play the Olympics, you won two gold medals, so you're doing that on the off season and you're trying yeah. to get that part going and training for doing your camps. What is the conversational life like with your wife and kids to say, listen, this is what I'm doing. How did that conversation go? Well, with the kids, it's different. So like the communication with, the, with our children is that you know, Pops is working hard. This is the level of attention to detail you need to have in everything you do. So it's, it's setting the example. Same thing with my wife. My wife's a stay-at-home wife. It's the hardest job, man. Right. So she works really hard at that. I mean, it's, you know, and so her attention to detail with that as well are examples for our children. And then for my wife, it's, you know, she's as competitive as I am. So she's like, listen, man, if you're going to be out here training eight hours a day, if you're going to spend nine months out of the year away from your family, you better fucking win the championship. <laughs> what are we doing this for? <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? I love that. You know, um, but it's a balancing act. And that's the thing that's important is understanding that we have to have so much energy. Because for like Natalia and Gianna when they were babies, especially Natalia because they're doing prime years. Um, and I go to practice and I would train and you know, I play the game and you know, I come home and I'd be sore and I'd be tired. And she wants to go swimming. She wants me to take her to the park. She wants to just jump on my back or whatever the case may be. You can't say, I'm too tired, I'm going to lay down. Mm. That's not fair. She don't know what the hell's going on, right? And if this was a game, you'd suck it up and play. I play games with the flu. I play games with 102 degree fever, man. Powerful. You can't do that. That you is can't. so powerful. Right? Man. You gotta be on, man. That's big. What's the least amount of sleep you play the game on? No sleep. <laughs> you play, play the game, the game with zero no sleep. sleep. Zero sleep. <laughs> Zero sleep. It's like, you know, um, kids, you know, Natalia had a certain, you know, health situation, what have you, and you're staying up all night, and then uh, you got to go out and perform because fans don't know, you know, teammates don't know, nor do they care, nor should they, that you've been up all night. You got to perform, right? And so, um, you just got you just got to go to work, man. It's respect. That's it's it. respect. And, and and I think one of the things that for, for for some if you follow basketball or not that you and Mike had in common is that it wasn't hey I'm going to take eight games off this year to try to stay healthy. The mindset <laughs> of going, you know like that to you is comical, right? Know. To do that. What the hell is that, man? I don't know what that is. That's crazy. Seriously, it's crazy. Like you know you, you got a lot of people playing their hard-earned money to come watch you perform. 
perform. Perform. It's your job to be in shape. It's your job to be strong enough to perform at that level every single night. I don't deal with people that don't commit at that level, but then act as if they do. I wasn't invited to parties or you know friendly, friendly gatherings on the weekend. So on Fridays and Saturdays, I would go to my rec room with my basketball and basically dribble myself to sleep. And I think that that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Because during those lonely hours in the rec room, I discovered the hunger, the motivation, and the desire to be the best possible basketball player that I could be. We're not on this stage just because of talent or ability. We're up here because of 4 a.m. We're up here because of two-a-days or five-a-days. We're up here because we had a dream and let nothing stand in our way. If anything tried to bring us down, we used it to make us stronger. We were never satisfied, never finished, will never be retired. My high school English teacher, Mr. Fisk, he had this beautiful quote, rest at the end, not in the middle. And I took that to heart. My next dream is to be honored one day for inspiring the next generation of athletes to have a dream, sacrifice for it, and never ever rest in the middle. Thank you for joining us, I'm Don Lemon. Right now, so much of the world is just in shock and disbelief, trying to process what has happened today and make some sense of this gigantic loss. Here's what we know right now, and even though it has been several hours, it is still stunning to say the words that Kobe Bryant, the legendary NBA star, is dead tonight. Life is short and it's fragile, and we don't know how many birthdays we have, so just celebrate life. And if you haven't told someone you love them, do it now. Do it. Tell people you love them. Kobe left nothing in the tank. He left it all on the floor. Maybe it surprised people that Kobe and I were very close friends. But we were very close friends. Kobe was my dear friend. He was like a little brother. This kid had passion like you would never know. It's, a, it's an amazing thing about passion. If you love something, if you have a strong passion for something, you would go to the extreme to, to try to understand or try to get it. No matter where he saw me, it was a challenge. And I admired him because his passion, you rarely see someone who's looking and trying to improve each and every day. 20 years had passed and he felt that he had accomplished all that he set out to accomplish. But what he come to realize is that the goal that he set out initially of becoming the greatest of all time was a very fickle one. And when he realized that the most important thing is how your career moves and touches those around you and how it carries forward to the next generation. And you realize that's what makes true greatness.